Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our second session. Apologies for the slight delay. This is not yet a scheduled eVTOL operation. We have a little bit of a delay today on our, um, uh, on our takeoff of this uh, panel. Um, I'm very happy that all of you could make it. I'm, uh, I'm welcoming every one of you here. Thank you for finding the time to be with us for this uh, very interesting subject matter. Also, very warm welcome to the uh, participants that join us um, remotely, so online. I would like to um, hit the road on our journey to why do we, uh, why do we, what lessons to have we learned from the various eVTOL and IAM demonstrations that took place in European airspace so far by introducing uh, very briefly um, my dear panelists and um, we are the, the fullest panel, I understand. We even needed an extra chair up here. So it's been cozy. We will not, we will not freeze up here, I think. No? Uh, Solène, to my, to my right. Welcome, Solène, uh, who is responsible for AAM in Group ADP. Solène is overseeing the strateg strategic and business development of AAM, the specific vertiport development within four sites across Paris and the integration of eVTOL across the aviation airspace. Thank you very much for, for, for being with us, Solène. Then, um, next to Solène, we have Maurizio, who is, has been appointed the ENAF uh, Italy Chief Operating Officer in 2018 after having served as the ENAF Head of Air Navigation Service Directorate since uh, actually 2011 internationally. He secures the involvement of ENAF in certain key programs and partnerships, for example, the CESAR deployment. And then we have... And I survived, huh? You survived that, yeah? <laughs> the CESAR deployment. The program. <laughs> the program. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well managed. Um, congratulations for, for that and uh, for, being, for being able to be here today, Maurizio. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have, um, we have um, Christian. Uh, actually, Christian comes from Volocopter and has been uh, working in drones and AAM topics for more than 15 years and uh, is currently Volocopter's head of global policy and regulatory efforts, previously holding, having held similar roles in uh, other industry players, for example, DJI. Um, then, to my, uh, to my left, Carmela, welcome. Again, Carmela is... Um, is well known in uh, European and Italian aviation as well, with a master's degree in aviation engineering and more than 30 years work experience uh, in almost all the domains that make up a regulator, I understand, in ENAC, in, so that is the Italian CAA, and Camilla is currently ENAC's Director of Research and Development for New Technologies in Aerospace, Depa aerospace Department. It uh, Kamena, in her current role, is, uh, take, is developing a, a new approach to facilitating aviation in Italy with, uh, while avoiding uh, a temptation or a tendency of overregulation. So that's a very fine field. I guess we get to this mm. during our um, discussions. And then from another continent, welcome to, uh, to our panel, Jale. We know each other from uh, Singapore, a symposium where we have been working together already. Uh, Jale is, um, is representing Skyports and comes here to uh, also share maybe the view, the perspectives um, from, from an overseas operator. He's the regulatory affairs manager at Skyports and the re overseeing regulatory compliance, safety and operational planning for Skyports infrastructure projects in Asia Pacific. And before that, Jale actually was with the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore um, in, in various roles. Last not least, Juanjo, as you are commonly being called, right? Juan Jose Sola uh, from Spain, from AESA, with more than 15 years of experience in aviation in both private and public sectors. He's currently the head of the U.S. division in the Spanish CIA and uh, a member also of the ICAO ARPAS panel and a uh, member of JAROS. And uh, what else do I have here? And you are our EASA US focal point, of course. Yes, so we work very closely. Thanks um, 
for, for being here with us. He will have two master's degree in aerospace engineering and in management. And uh, by the way, uh, Juanjo is also an airplane and a US pilot, pilot and has an initial training even in the ATCO domain, so ATC uh, as an ATC controller. Very diverse range of experiences, but with certain commonalities um, from across Europe, um, but not limited to Europe. And uh, our topic is on the lessons learned the, that can be drawn from the various demos that we've had. Um, because we are so full with six people, um, I had kindly asked every panelist to restrict his opening or her opening pitch to just one slide for the sake of time. Before we go there, this one you will, you will rec recall from previous uh, sessions. Please interact with us. We will take your questions on a time available basis uh, during our uh, session here and you can upvote uh, questions of colleagues that you like and uh, please make use of this. And a quick time check, we have 66 minutes remaining <laughs> and we, we head off, we head off the road with, um, with Solène in the order of, uh, of our sequence here. Solen, can I please hand over the floor to you sure. to your make your key messages to the sure, public? Sure, thank you very much. So I'm Solen Lubris, head of AEM in Group ADP. Uh, so as you can see in the slide here, uh, we have developed a sandbox uh, in one of our aerodrome in Paris. Um, the story actually started in 2019, where we actually sent uh, and launched a call for interest uh, for different partners to cover the entire AEM chain value. Uh, obviously, we're interested in eVTOL manufacturer OEMs, but also uh, with other partners like infrastructure, operations, airspace integration, and also social acceptability. So we actually selected many different partners in all these categories. Uh, and then two main phases um, for, for this project, for this air experimental site. Uh, the first phase was, as you can see, in September 2021, where we actually opened that experimental site. So that was done uh, already, and we had like the FATO, so the takeoff and landing area. Uh, we had like uh, the hangar and all the maintenance that could be done, uh, and the taxiway. We're quite proud of that taxiway because there's a sign because it was VTOL only taxiway, which is quite became quite famous uh, within the ADP. Uh, and then the second phase was. Um, last November, where it was actually a very important inauguration, we'll come back to that, important integration in November where we had pretty much full integrated vertiport and the first fully integrated vertiport in Europe, where we had obviously the FATO, the stands, uh, but we had also like a building with skyports uh, that we created and that building we could come and test uh, the passenger journey. So we have done like this entire experimental site to come and test everything. As you can see, the vehicle test, uh, the ground infrastructure integration test, and the airspace integration. And during our inauguration in November, uh, what was also quite a breakthrough was the fact that we integrated a piloted uh, eVTOL within conventional aircraft. So we opened our airspace and we made it work together as a very first step of integration. There has been a lot going on. Yeah, <laughs> there has been a lot and, going uh, on. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm <laughs> thankful for a, a yet st a long time standing invitation to come and see Pontoise yes. and what you have established there. Yeah. Um, it will come very soon, <laughs> I, <laughs> right. I hope. Thank you very much. So, Len, um, we move on um, to Italy and uh, to hear from Maurizio maybe some, uh, some perspectives, from notably from, uh, from the Rome airports. Okay, first of all, um, I'm representing the rigid world of the ATM, so please be nice with me because, you know, <laughs> it's quite difficult sometimes. Okay, we, we started the experience of the Vertiport, Piano Bella Vertiport, close to the most congested airport of Italy, Fiumicino. So it was a great challenge. And the key message that uh, we had after this experience, first of all, we need a strong cooperation with the ATM and uh, the drone operators and uh, the possible future USSP, which is crucial to the, for the success of uh, any initiative. Then we have to consider also uh, 
the impact of the normal operation of uh, uh, standard general aviation or commercial aviation with the drones. So it's important to investigate more. And so we need a lot of experience and training. And uh, as can I, I can say, uh, a lot of uh, uh, new concept to be analyzed. And first of all, uh, one single point that I want to add, uh, we know that uh, the airspace in Europe is not designed for uh, USSP operation and for EVTOR operation. Mm. So we try to harmonize the operation close to the airport, what it was very, very challenging because we started to build the, the house from the roof, more or less. But uh, uh, we got a lot of experience from that, uh, from that uh, trial. But the first thing is that uh, we need to find something which is completely different uh, for the nowadays uh, uh, regulation to permit the VTOL to work in the proper way. The experience was very interesting, but we discovered a lot of uh, uh, things that we had to improve. First of all, which kind of rules to apply to this kind of uh, flying object, which is completely different from the experience. Anyway, uh, this is the key message uh, for our side, uh, strong coordination, because I analyzed just a, a little portion of the operational side. And we need uh, a strong cooperation among all the stakeholders. This is our uh, uh, point uh, for the evolution of the operation ABTOL. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maurizio. So obviously, Christian, you have been one of those stakeholders that Maurizio has mentioned. Hmm? Can you let us know what, uh, what is your takeaway from the various, uh, not only the one in Rome, but the various demo flights that you have done in, in European airspace? I'll do my best at least. Um, and thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, so Volocopter, you can say, we test every week. Uh, demos, yes, we do something that's more public facing, like we've done in Pontoise, like we've done in Rome. But we test every week because as an OEM, that's part of our test flight program. Um, some of them, some of those test flights, yes, they're not conducted in our home airfield in Germany, but they're conducted towards a, or in front of a larger public audience. We've done it in Pontoise, we've done it in Rome. We actually did it all the way back in Helsinki as part of one of the CESAR projects, the GOF project um, a couple of years ago. Um, so that we do so many flights, that also means we learn all the time. So, so the message here really needs to be concentrated on what are the key learnings, right? Because obviously there's a lot of things that we learn about flight performance and how we design the aircraft every time we fly. Um, but more on the operational side, for us it's been really eye-opening on how many different actors, how many different stakeholders there are in the aviation community that we need to engage with to make this happen. Because we've got the existing uh, aviation stakeholders we know, we've got vertiport operators, we will have ATM, we will have ANSPs, we will have USSPs, uh, we will have regulators, we will have EASA uh, on top of everything. But in, in our field, it's just as much about local authorities and local government and regional government um, who all of a sudden play a role because aviation is new in their um, vicinities, right? Um, then, then obviously, uh, Solen mentioned that we, we've looked at how do we actually do everything together. And that's from an OEM perspective and an operator perspective, it's pretty clear that we learn what are the requirements for vertiports and how is that going to look like for the future because it's still, it's still novel ground here, right? Then, then we've experienced that when we look at the routes, also not just for the, the demo and test flights, but when we actually go to market in the next couple of years, there is no two, no two countries or no two cities that are the same. It's, uh, it's different routes that we're looking at. Uh, the issues we are facing with different route planning may be the same, but you can say it's, it's a new process we start every time uh, to ensure that we take local settings and local circumstances into account. And then just let me check what the last point I had on here, which is obvious, it's needless to say that this is new. EASA has been very forward-looking in terms that we have the, uh, the certification um, rules in place, but we now need to figure out how are the operations actually going to take place with 
uh, with the regulation we have coming from EASA and the national implementation from regulators. And because we are still are kind of outside that uh, setting and operating on a, um, an exemption and a case-by-case -case basis, every case is new, and that's going to require a lot of coordination when we see that going forward. Coordination with multiple yet un uh, unknown stakeholders potentially, the novelty, etc. I think this, this is a nice transition also uh, to your pitch, uh, Camilla, and your perspective uh, as the Italian authority being part of the game and what you have in mind in order to, you know, to, um, to address this. Okay. Do you... No. No, your microphone is AOG. It's on? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting us in this, uh, in this panel. Uh, I would like to, to present our experience. Uh, uh, in principle, uh, innovation uh, is moving uh, fast in all domains in general, but uh, uh, aviation uh, is uh, is a very regulated uh, uh, regulated domain so uh, digitalization the electrif electrification uh, ask to the regulator to to have a new role a new approach in order to to facilitate the crea the creation of a, a ecosystem uh, where uh, all actors can uh, can uh, work together to enable this uh, new uh, innovative area mobility. Uh, in uh, 2021, uh, we publish a strategic plan with the relevant uh, business plan and uh, and uh, roadmap. Uh, it's uh, d d this roadmap uh, identif identify uh, specific tests fresh. and demonstrations in order to enable uh, uh, four prioritizing applications: air taxi, medical good delivery, and uh, agricultural support monitoring and inspection. Um, we, we envision uh, a, a new approach uh, which would try to create uh, a, a safe testing uh, called uh, test testing uh, such as Sandbox where, the, where we can open a, a direct dialogue with the industry and uh, with the operator in order to test their, uh, their new products and to, to envisage the, the lack, the gap in, 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 our, in the present regulation. Uh, this dialogue uh, is uh, very important uh, and uh, in, our, in our opinion has to be open uh, between the national authority, industry and the EASA. Uh, Last but not least, it's very important that uh, this, uh, the creation of this new service uh, will be uh, will done in a, a in dual, uh, dual scenario. We have to cooperate with all stakeholders, uh, national uh, local authorities, uh, civil and military stakeholders, and uh, we, need, we, 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 we open a, poly, a, a policy of, uh, of alliance with the territories, uh, and we sign a memorandum of understanding with the territories, cities, uh, regions, in order to collect their needs to, to, to make faster the, the enable this uh, mobility. Uh, last but not least, we think that the, the investment cost, the business model is very important because all of, uh, of these has to be sustainable. And uh, uh, sustainability is not only economic sustainability, but is a sustainability in terms of public acceptance too. So we are working a lot about uh, this, uh, this aspect. Thank you, Camilla. So, um, sandbox is a key word here. We will certainly get back to this. Uh, what what uh, what exactly that means? What it is it might be good for? Uh, let's travel twelve thousand and a bit kilometers to the Southeast Asian region to Singapore. Jale, what's going on in Singapore? In right. Um, so, so even though I, I come from Singapore, but uh, Skyport is actually a global company. We have projects all around the world. 
uh, including in Paris, uh, which is our key project in Europe, uh, together with ADP, of course, uh, where we work together, designing this, this body port, doing tests together with uh, our partners, our OEMs, our technology partners. Uh, and of course, it is designed based on the design specifications drafted by IASA uh, for the body ports. Um, of course, we have a prototype in Singapore that we built before. Uh, and then we have one in the US, and we are building one more, which is going to be operationalized uh, in Dubai uh, in 2026. And we, we learn a lot from, from our projects. All of these mainly, they start off as um, test beds. Uh, they, they allow us to test our technologies uh, and work with our partners. And through all of this, I think uh, what we really realize is we need everyone, uh, all the stakeholders together in the game, uh, whether you are the ANSP, whether you are the regulator, the OEM, the operator. Um, we, we can't do this alone uh, as a vertical operator, and neither could any of the partners here do it alone. Uh, and, and we really need everyone to come together and see what are the interface issues that we need to solve. I mean, like um, just now, Volocopter mentioned that um, they, they are doing on a case by case basis, but then how do we get to uh, a stage where we are able to operate um, day to day? Uh, we get one authorization to, to, to do work like an airline for, for Volocopter and then us like a vertical operator. Uh, and we need to get these uh, issues solved out uh, very early, uh, which is why we are creating all these test bits so that people can come together. Um, and of course, from this, it helps us to accelerate our understanding of what AAM is, what IAM is all about. Uh, is it the same as traditional aviation? If you look at a vertipod, it probably is very similar to what a helicopter, a helipod is. Uh, but when we talk about the operations, the, the interactions with the ANSPs, the interaction with the aircraft operators, it, it will be slightly different. The airspace that you're operating at is lower. Uh, and, of, and, and that is why uh, we, we need to start um, the conversation. And of course, uh, in all the projects that we are seeing, uh, it is very important that the government take a leading role. Well, because that is when, when the government uh, has a will to push ahead these projects, uh, it often helps to bring together all the other regulatory stakeholders. Because uh, when you want to build a verdict port, we want to operate AAM. It's not just about the aviation authorities. You have your um, fire rescue, you have your building authorities, you have your, your, your people who are more concerned about the social impact, the economic impact, and then everyone has to come in. Uh, and and for, for us, dealing with the, the aviation regulator alone is, is not enough. Uh, and that, that's where when we go into a market, uh, when there's a government authority that's able to rally everyone together uh, with other government agencies, then that really helps us to push ahead with AM. Uh, and I think that we, we have identified very, very strong markets uh, around the world that are willing to do that. Uh, and definitely, they are pushing the, the forefront of uh, the developments for AM and IAM. So, so that's generally our learning uh, for, for uh, Skypods, and, and I hope that uh, this is something that we can bring forward uh, in Europe as well, which is going to be definitely one of the launch markets in the world. A lot of commonalities uh, to what we, what we have heard, also experienced in your part of the world. Thank you, Jelle. Uh, one question comes to my mind, maybe you remind me later on, should I forget. How do you, how do you identify all the actors that you need to address? And, and who takes the lead in coordinating? Uh, to me, this seems to be crucial and um, not, maybe not, not very clear. It's, it's uh, equally a question to, to all of you, of course. But before, we, let's, uh, let's zoom ourselves back to beautiful Spain, where also a lot's going on, Juanjo, in your country, and uh, there's a lot of activity also on, on eVTOL demos and test flights, etc. So um, I bring up your slide and mm -hmm. uh, hand the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sasa, and thank you, thanks to EASA for inviting us. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And I bring, uh, to start, I bring four uh, for lessons learned, and the first lesson learned is the importance of timing. All of these processes take time, and if we have uh, a look at the whole picture, uh, we can see that there are many stakeholders involved, and there are many, many aspects uh, to consider as well. And of course, the technology is here, but it has to be properly tested. And we have to ensure that every step taken is in the correct way. The second lesson learned in terms of operational authorization and in practice is that uh, we can classify all of these uh, demonstrations into three categories or into three groups. First, VB loss operation uh, with drones uh, up to 25 kilos uh, with a characteristic, characteristic dimension less than three meters, mainly for 
surveillance, uh, delivery, or inspection. The second group is uh, air taxis concept. Uh, I mean uh, those aircraft, big aircraft with uh, more than three meter size and more than 600 kilos EBITOLs. And there are others like use space uh, simulators or connectivity test. And that, of course, there is the possibility of a combination of, of them. Uh, the third lesson learned is, at least in our case, in our case, is all of the operational authorization that we have granted were in sale too. So operators had or have no intention on going through a design verification report process. Uh, and for this reason, the, the, the flight envelopes of this kind of flights, or the, this kind of test, were very, very, very conservative. Uh, mostly, or most of them over a control ground area, control ground zone, sorry, uh, in a very low altitude, in segregated airspace, velos, with high adjacent areas, uh, without population there, and uh, mainly in test centers, mainly. The, the, four, uh, the four lesson learned, uh, and I think it's something that uh, you, all of you have highlighted, uh, is the need for some boxes. Uh, we realized, uh, we have realized that the, the, the specific category is not suitable enough for air taxis test. And um, I think we have to find another tool uh, that, uh, let's say, facilitate, that accelerate uh, this kind of trials. We, we, can, we can go, go, go uh, uh, on this uh, later. And uh, I think that uh, operators and manufacturers, they want to fly now and they want to fly as much as, as, much as possible to test their platforms. And I think uh, a significant number of flight hours uh, are needed to, to face and to guarantee the certified category. And that's all for, for the moment. Thank you. So a recurring theme is this sandbox. No? Uh, we, that seems to be a, a topic we need to, we need to address uh, in a bit more detail. Um, and what we mean with that sandbox in our context. Before uh, I bring up this slide, please, as a, f as a polite reminder, to interact and engage with us. Shoot us your questions. You can do that anonymously, of course. You can uh, see what your other um, audience colleagues have already posted and vote for if you like a question. And we, are, we will bring this up uh, and, uh, and see that uh, we can address that. Probably not all of them, because we will, as always, be running out of time, but at least some. So, um, sandboxes. It's not full of sand, no? Maybe in <laughs> Spain? But what is it? It's an exp it's a, uh, just to be on the same page, what we, what we mean. Often also we speak about regulatory sandboxes. Is it really that what we mean? Do we need a regulatory sandbox? Or do we need a geographic area that is sufficiently uh, segregated, uh, like a playground where industry can, uh, can freely test and trial? Uh, what is it that we need when we speak about sandboxes? Uh, what it is that you have established in your country? Who wants to take that? Can take Selene, that. Yes, yeah, definitely. Please. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, I mean, you've seen the picture already. So we've established uh, what we call a sandbox. But for us, the regulatory aspect was definitely uh, important. And that's why, like, I think, uh, and, and, and to be very honest, I think that's a very uh, good anecdote, is that we started and uh, the prototype uh, uh, specifications from IASA uh, were not published at the time we started. So we actually based it to start on the heliport design. Uh, and then we had to uh, adapt it uh, to, uh, to the prototype uh, specification from IASA. Uh, and pretty much like in terms of FATO, there were some changes. Obviously, there was a V uh, instead of an H, and that sort of thing that we had to go back and redo. Uh, but except from that, I mean, there's definitely a regulatory aspect that I think is very important, and we should use more the sandboxes for that. Um, but what we do really is uh, actually test 
to for in, in our in I mean in our specific case we're doing it uh, so that we can then deploy an objective for us is Paris 2024 is to deploy bigger scale. So it's literally like you have a test bed that you have an experimental site where you can come and test everything. So we've got the vertiport, we've got the phaeton, we've got the parking stand, you've got you can test pretty much everything in terms of passenger journey from the check-in to the boarding of the VTOL, you can come and test that entire passenger journey. What are the safety considerations that you take into account? Is it different than in airport? Is it so it's all this question that you can actually uh, uh, you can actually ask? You can also do uh, airspace integration as we have done. So we started by closing the airspace and only having volocopter flying, but sort of like within an enclosed volume, separated from the traffic. And slowly, with the French Civil Aviation Authority, we've moved towards something more open. And then in the last experimentation in November 2022, we had cohabitation between conventional aircraft and the Velocity. So it's also for this airspace integration sort of a test. So we can literally come and test every single aspect before going in a bigger scale, uh, in a bigger scale in Paris. So for me, that's, that's what is a sandbox. But that's okay. my perspective with our ambition, obviously. Uh, and then to recreate what we have done uh, in Pontoise in five sites across Paris for 2024. So obviously, these sites are extremely important to come and test every single aspect uh, uh, for that. So the full, the full thing, the yeah. full journey for the passenger. A question to, AT, to our ATM uh, colleague around the table. <laughs> yes, nothing to add more. Because this is the, the idea uh, yeah. that is important. Uh, I would like just to underline that it is important to test also the procedure and the possible evolution of the regulation. This is important because we know the industry is working, the has, uh, is it has the, their playground, more or less. But it's important also to test what will be the future, uh, the possible evolution of the service that we have to apply to this kind of newcomers, let's say to the eVTOL, for instance, uh, to imagine something which is uh, specific done for this kind of uh, segment of the aviation. Because nowadays, uh, as a service providers, it's very complex to manage eVTOL operation uh, in integrated airspace. First of all, because uh, we don't know what kind of service we have to provide. Secondly, because we have to harmonize the different, uh, 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 let's say, level of traffic. Uh, imagine having uh, an eVTOL working around at a congested airport. Mm. The service, the ATS, uh, is not able to manage in a proper way this kind uh, of uh, new uh, flying object because uh, for instance, if uh, he's operating in VFR, he has to have the on board the transponder if the iSpace is classified as Charlie or Delta. That is not the case for eVTOL. So that it's important uh, to having a, a sandbox to explore all the possibility that a connection and adaptation that we have to explore to adapt uh, the new service that we have to deliver to the specific segment of this aviation. So sandbox and crucial for us, uh, but not only on uh, industrial, uh, with industrial approach, also to test the procedure, uh, the possible uh, evolution uh, of the, uh, um, uh, the legislation, for instance. This is crucial for us. Because you know, we are quite rigid. Our approach is quite rigid, and we have to think in a different way, to create a sort of ecosystem where all the stakeholders can test uh, the possible evolution of their procedures. And when establishing those sandboxes in your various uh, experiences that you have made, have you come across any specific difficulty? I mean, we understand the common notion of a sandbox is a good thing for testing this from A to Z, okay? The whole process. Um, but what's the barrier to establishing a sandbox today? What is missing in order to do that maybe more efficiently and faster to establish a sandbox? I mean, Camilla, uh, maybe this is something for you? Uh, okay. In, a, in, a, in our experience, uh, I would like to clarify that uh, um, our vision of a sandbox is, a now, is not a test bed, it's a more, it's a, it's a process that uh, could be result in establish a segregated area where we can test technologies 
uh, or products or services uh, and uh, could be a, um, a real life uh, environment where uh, a direct dialogue with the authority, not only national, but a other two cooperation with the national authority, uh, will be open in order to uh, to better understand if the actual regulation is a real adequate at uh, the innovative products that uh, are uh, are. Uh, are product are producting by industry in this moment because innovation is moving fast and the regulation uh, has different uh, velocity. So uh, our experience uh, is uh, is that uh, we qu we can have a technological like experimental sandboxes just for uh, experiment some uh, for testing new technologies. Uh, that uh, are already covered by the actual by the actual regulation, and uh, we uh, we can have the the industry and the regulator for learning for uh, for establish a, a better regulation could be the necessity the needs to work with the industry in a, in a, in a real life and a safe environment uh, to. To, to achieve the challenge of, uh, of, uh, of new regulation for, uh, for some product, for example, Butol, uh, I think that uh, we, 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 mod, uh, we, we need more tests for a Butol in order to establish the, their reserve, uh, the, the energy reserve requirements, and uh, as said by my colleagues, to establish procedure for rules, uh, for flight rules, because WFR helicopter routes, in, in our opinion, are not sufficient for these new entries, because these new entries will come into the, our cities, will come in a no aviation scenario. So we, 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 we have to, to do more. No aviation scenario, Camilla? Can you not can only aviation scenario because urban ah, not only. city. Yes, okay. Not only. It goes not beyond only. aviation. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, I had asked a question earlier. Uh, uh, let me get back to this. How? I mean, also the stakeholder uh, notion was was a common thing. Okay. We need to know, we have to deal with different stakeholders, we need to know, we put, have to put them all in the same boat in order to work with them collaboratively. It's all nice and fine if you plan for those demos, okay, as you have done in your various countries. But how did you make sure you're not accidentally forgetting one of those new stakeholders that you might even not be aware of yet? Or maybe it has happened even that you were planning for your demo flights and all of a sudden, during the process, or even afterwards, you figured out that, oh, damn, I should have maybe also considered this or that new actor that should have been part of the game. Who wants to take that and share experience? Please. <laughs> Christian, you're smiling. Yeah, I'm smiling, but I, probably I can't think of... I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying I can't think of a situation where we forgot someone. But I mean, the the answer is you you do your homework, right? So so you know who are the established aviation stakeholders. For me, the the real challenge is that that not just in demonstrations, but remember that live operations are probably next year in Paris. Um, it, it's taking aviation as we know it and that set of stakeholders and going beyond that, be because we're taking aviation into cities where we don't usually take it. Um, so, so it's also, there, there's a lot of, let's say, learning by doing in, in doing this. So because you can map out who is it that we want included and sure, you, we, we want the vertiport operators or the airport operators, you want the aircraft operator, the airline, you want the manufacturer, you want the ANSP, uh, you want the regulator, but that's kind of where our traditional aviation world ends. So, so how do you go beyond that? How do you go in to get the environmental authorities? How do you go in to get city authorities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That, that's learning by doing. And I, I honestly also think that 
we've that that's part of the demo process. That's part of the sandboxing process. That we we tried this so far, but I'd almost be surprised if there isn't surprises ahead as we get closer to commercial operations and actual entry into service. Okay. Um, uh, I like the notion that you then the, the picture that you you painted. That, uh, historically, I used to say people were going to aviation. They were traveling out of their city to the airport to take a flight, right? So now it's the reverse. We are now bringing aviation to the people where they actually live and work, and that we do in very low level aviation as well, in addition. So uh, that may, may play a role, so also with the new, uh, new actors that, uh, that are here. Jale, is there anything, because I think in Singapore you, you, you made this exercise and you have the various local authorities and who is responsible for this and that, left and, uh, left and right of the river and yeah. the pedestrian walkway, etc. Yes. Yeah, so so um, maybe I'll just share experiences from Singapore, because in Singapore we're also working with Volocopter to try and launch commercial AN services. Uh, and we work very closely with the government, uh, whether is it the CAA or there's the Economic Development Board. So these two agencies in Singapore, they are very keen on pushing uh, for AAM and IM in, in Singapore, making sure that we, we can bring the service into the country. Uh, and, and I mean, usually a CAA will look at regulatory aspects, but they are also looking at how they can facilitate our operations. So. These two agencies in Singapore, what they try to do is they, they rally all the other government agencies together and they talk to us, uh, be it Volocopter, Skyports, uh, we'll see what do we need to address. When, when you want to build a birdie pot, then you realise that you need to talk to people who are managing the parks because you need to now remove trees for the OLS. And then because we are building our site very near to the coast, you need to talk to people who manage the coastline and they tell them that you need to do coastal protection. Uh, but, but we are very lucky uh, for, for the Singapore project where the government aid, uh, agencies are very supportive uh, and, and try to have just a single point of contact for us to, to, to list out all the issues that we have. Uh, and then from there, uh, through this single point of contact, we will then provide our responses and help to address whatever concerns the government may have. Uh, and, and I think that is something that is also very useful if we go to other markets. I mean, in, in Dubai, now that we are going into Dubai, uh, we are also expecting that, 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 could be, uh, that the government will be help, helping to facilitate some of these conversations for us. Uh, and, I, and I think for even for Paris, right, uh, working with ADP, working with um, the, the, the city government, uh, it's easier to, to, to work through the governments and find the right contacts. Um, they will tell us, point us to the right agencies to tell us, okay, you need to talk to this person, you talk to the other person. Uh, and then, and that's, that's how, how we get the project going. Uh, and we are not doing this on our own. Yeah. And that you see as a government role, uh, a government task to point the industry to the yes. right uh, actors. Yeah. Is that also something that you can share, Christian? That because I, I think the more actors, you, the more cooks you put around the, uh, in the kitchen, right? The, 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 the higher the chance that uh, the meal is completely messed up and someone needs to coordinate the whole uh, cooking process. So who should that be? Is it the, uh, is it the, op the OEM, the operator, or is it a, maybe a government function? Yeah. Maybe even a non-aviation actor yeah, takes I, the lead? I don't think there is an answer yet. And again, I think that's one of the, uh, the things we're actually learning. I, you can say what we have in common is we, we all share the ambition. Of come of presenting these products, right? And if, if it's if it's us from an OEM airline perspective, it's if it's Solen from from the ADP perspective, it's the ANSP perspective. We all have that in common. And to me, the kind of the drawing on some experiences from manned aviation, there is in an airport environment there is something called collaborative decision making, mm -hmm. and it's kind of the same here. Mm -hmm. So so we are finding out who is it that's actually responsible for this as we go along. But the good thing is that we share the same ambition and then we'll have to define it along the way. I don't think you can expect government um, to point you to all stakeholders that needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, but because government itself is various levels and various stakeholders with potentially various opinions. Juanjo, you, you mentioned the notion of plan ahead and, and, and calculate a good chunk of time before, you know, from receiving a request from doing a, some sort of a demo or, or a sandbox or whatever uh, operation until you actually have everything in place to conduct it. I would be interested to get an idea of what's the approximate timeline that you, that you experienced, for example, that was appropriate. Yes, <coughs> it's, it's difficult to say because as you can imagine, we have a lot of burden in Spain and I don't know exactly how this works in other countries, but 
We have a variety of application and coordination before uh, the operator, the operator move the stick and fly. And is our operational authorization uh, take some months. Uh, to be honest, um, the, uh, that, that uh, depends on if this authorization is the first one that we have uh, faced. Mm -hmm. Because uh, every single uh, authori uh, operational authorization for us was a project and that consisted in an iterative process with the, with, the, um, with the operator. And of course, we learned from each other. Once we have, let's say, approved one different conops like swarming or mm, uh, uh, EBTOLs and in DLOS or whatever, for us, it takes less time. So uh, I would say that uh, it takes three, four months for, for the first time. I, I am talking about this complex authorization, of course, but, but after that, it, it, uh, one of these can take uh, uh, from our side uh, one month, two weeks, but uh, as uh, all, all of my colleagues mentioned, there are many, many stakeholders involved. So sometimes time depends not only in our, in our approval, it depends also in the, in the other coordination with the NSP, with the police, with the, with the cities. Mm -hmm. So I could say uh, some months for the first time and maybe one month for for next time with the same conops. Okay, thank you. Can that be can that be shared? Is this an ex um, uh, some some experience that? I do. I, I mean, I you, Volocopter is a, probably amongst those OEMs that has a largest footprint of having performed demo flights, at least from a European com uh, context. Of course, there is. Uh, of course, there are experiences you can draw on every time, and you get wiser all the time. But, but I will say again, every situation is unique. And as Juanjo said in the beginning, that Spain is a unique environment that you cannot directly transfer to France or Italy. It's um, we're in the fortunate position that we've got regulators also talking to each other uh, and learning from each other. Um, but I, I'd be careful saying that you can transfer those kind of things. Okay. That brings me actually to the next question. I was asked yesterday when uh, making a little uh, interview uh, advertising for, for, for this uh, panel session, um, the interviewer asked me, why is it that we are doing, why do we have to repeat these demos in all kinds of European cities over and again? What's the, what's the value of that? So why, why are we doing that? Uh, that's an open question probably to all of you. Like, in, in equal terms. Is there, what's the benefit? Is it because you said every city is, is completely different? Is it because of other factors? Is it uh, to build up operational experience or a combination of those? I think it's also because uh, you have to have the onboarding of the, the for example, for, as the French Civil Aviation Authority. So they are the one who are giving authorization. I mean, obviously the certification is given by EASA, but then after that on, on, on the routes, on the operations, on everything, you need to have their buy-in. And I think it goes back to the question where you had earlier about the challenges. I mean, for us, one of the challenges was obviously to get the right authorization, and I guess it's the same uh, in all the countries. Um, and But also that challenge becomes very bef beneficial because then once you have the onboarding, for example, for us at the French Civil Aviation Authority, then they are on board on that project and as exactly as you were saying earlier, you learn by doing and you learn by seeing. And actually, when we had uh, the VC2X from Volocopter a few times in Pontoise, you learn by seeing it. And then for the entire French Civil Aviation Authority, it changed a lot to actually see the behavior of the VTOL, see how you can maneuver, see when you're actually crossing the runway, how, how it works, uh, how it goes, and having all of that in terms of challenges become like an amazing opportunity to have the onboarding. So that's why I think, uh, to, to respond to your question, I think it has to be done pretty much like probably for onboarding of the French, uh, I mean, on the, of the Civil Aviation Authority. That's sort of like an important so part. And training, to provide training 
to the NAA by repeating the exercise. So to, to them, say, or thanks okay. to them, so that they can make some decisions, also in terms of like integration into the airspace. Yeah. So the idea, like for us, when we open in November 2022, when we had conventional aircraft and the VC2X from uh, from Volocopter, it's like, how do you make them work in the same airspace? How does it work? And then from the French Civil Aviation Authority, so it's a question of clearances, it's a question of separation, it's a question of all of that. And so then it likewise, together. providing familiarization to the ATM uh, colleagues. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I am also the old guy. Anyway, uh, uh, I think we are to work, uh, uh, I think in, in, in this segment, in this period, the ATM is not the solution of the problem because we are designed to provide a service uh, in, uh, in certain uh, standards which are completely different from uh, the experience that we are trying uh, to do now. So ATM, uh, uh, there is a question here, just, just to go straight to, to yes, the point, please, please yes, 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 yeah, about the airports, no? Yeah, very good. In my opinion... Uh, 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 let's uh, just repeat the question so that, the, uh, that we are clear which, uh, because it's not seen currently. Uh, yes, uh, his report is to be question number two. Number two, how eVTOL operations should be managed in the neighborhood of an airport not to disrupt manned aviation should it be managed by the ATC tower or independently? That's the I think exactly that's what you mean. Yeah. The question uh, is very interesting. In my opinion, should be uh, managed independently because the ATC is providing a certain service which is quite clear. First question, is the VTOL uh, uh, working as a VFR? Is flying as VFR? It's not the case, I think, because uh, if I apply the rules for the VFR, as I mentioned before, he has to fly 500 feet uh, uh, distant from the higher obstacle in the zone. If the altitude is so high, maybe the power, the endurance, uh, the, the, it, it will be shorter. Mm -hmm. so unless, we, uh, unless being granted an exemption, no? Yes, yes, okay, but okay, we have to, to find something different. Mm -hmm. So the ATS service <coughs> and the is not designed to, to provide such a kind of service. We have to find something different. So what I see, this is, a, this is my vision, it's not, uh, it's not a law, probably. Uh, uh, probably the USSP in a complex uh, ATM, uh, in a, a complex space, could provide uh, an harmonization between a manned and manned. Because I can see the advanced thermobido, EM, closest to the unmanned world instead of the classic uh, aviation world. So we had to move on a different way. Maybe we have, could have a specific provider for this segment of aviation, which is completely different from the ATM. And this is uh, something that we could try, we could test in a sandbox. Because, you know, uh, ATM is designed to provide service from, from aircraft flying at uh, eight miles per minute on the cruise. Mm. And for the approach is uh, uh, about uh, uh, one fourth, it's uh, three miles per minute. The speed for the EVTOL, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 kilometers, can, more or can less. depend on roughly between 100 60, kilometers at the top, it depends on the power. So it's, th th it's, it's different. So we have to think in a different way, in my opinion. So mm. sandbox could help us to find the right way to give a customized service to this kind of uh, eVTOL. Okay. And this is the challenge, not only for the ATM, but for all the, the stakeholders. And the sandbox could be an option that we have to explore, helping us to find the right way to manage this kind of traffic. Thank you, Maurizio. So that's, that's an interesting perspective that the, 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 the current ATM setup was not designed really to support uh, to support this, and we may need it, to find. That's what we discovered during the experience in Pianabella. Yeah. So, so it's important to, to say. Okay. Is, in the first place, the question could be: Is there actually any need for some sort of ATM service, at least in the initial phase, when you have a very low traffic density, and you have agreements in place, and you have a transponder that submits your position? Uh, let's say could. could at the initial phase, uh, could help to, to, to understand better what is the impact. Mm. But the evolution in Pan so, so mm -hmm. should be something different. Okay, you're looking already a bit Yes, because it, we know exactly the rules. 
that if I had to manage this kind of traffic as a simple VFR, mm. it's not an evolution of what we, have done, mm. we are doing now. Mm. But it would certainly be a starting point, no? For sure, but will the next step. So, um, my, my, my question would be, are we, are we tempted potentially to over-engineer from the beginning for something that is right now not yet needed for quite some time to come? If we talk about individual eVTOL operations, kind of a demonstration, you have one aircraft in the airspace volume at any given point in time, and not 15 at the same point, right? So do you have to have things in place already for the, for the future potential case when having 15 in place? Or is it good enough what we have today in order to uh, enable VFR-like operations of, uh, of one? If, if they are VFR operation, maybe uh, they are not able to, maybe to cover some distances. Because the more you go high, Yes, that's a performance issue. Okay, uh, yes, that's a performance. So, but a glider yeah. flying VFR may have the same performance issue after all, or a hot air balloon, no? Okay, that's 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 why we have to discuss about mm. the, the different vision. So mm. we we could have different vision, but we have uh, a playground where to test. Okay, I get your point. This. Is this being shared with uh, with my neighbors here to the left? Anything you want to add? Any controversial point, Camilla? Normally you are. You have uh, a very uh, clear uh, position, uh, no? No, 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 no pre clear position. Uh, we are we are exercised about these uh, these new topics, uh, and uh, I think that the, the the message coming from Maurizio is very important. We have to to approach in different way because we are, if we approach these uh, these new entries as uh, a classic uh, helicopter, uh, it, it's not. It, 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 it's not in use, it's not in innov innovative air mobility. Uh, but I think that um, if we, we, um, we envisage uh, a poss the possibility to, 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 to have, uh, to, to provide so some services to such new entries into space, we can give the possibility to enable space services in terms of economic sustainability because uh, at the moment uh, I think that U uh, space has a as a, a, a little bit in difficulty because uh, space enable enabling because the, there is a not clear uh, not clear business model for uh, for the for the US market so uh, uh, the possibility to use the low space for these new entries for for uh, for all innovative i services not all innovative i mobility but all innovative services uh, managed by uh, new services coming from for example U space service uh, in my opinion in our opinion uh, this uh, is a common opinion in italy but we are not the regular uh, at, uh, at the European level, it's just a suggestion. We suggest to to um, to exercise, to testing this opportunity, because uh, could be help all the all the innovative air service market. Maybe I can add on. Please, Charlie. Yes, yeah. go ahead. So maybe I can I can share some views over here. Uh, I, I I actually sh I mean I agree with Sasha. Like at the start, um, the volume is going to be very low. Um, I, I don't think within the first three or four years, or the next three or four years, we'll see like tens or hundreds of uh, EVTOLs flying in the, in the city. Um, firstly, your, your manufacturers must be able to ramp up their operations, uh, their manufacturing. Um, the, the, the airspace must be able to take in this kind of volume of operations. So at the start, I, I don't see uh, us having like tons of operations in the sky. So we, we should treat the problem step by step. We start simple. Uh, it, it probably at the start is going to be very similar to a helicopter operation. The, the volume is low. You just have a few aircraft operating maybe uh, every few hours or a few in a w one hour. And then after that, during this period, these few years at the start, uh, start working with the ATM, uh, the ANSPs, uh, the regulators. How do we then scale this up, right? Uh, when, when the volume ramps up, are we, are we expecting new models of uh, air traffic management? Uh, and, and that's the conversation that needs to get started. I mean, we, for, for aviation, we came a long way. Uh, it's a few decades of experience that where to, to reach where we are here today. And the low-level airspace is something that is not really uh, being 
are managed uh, as, as intensive as how traditional airports or like the, the wider airspace is being uh, managed. So, so that, that we need to take this step by step. Uh, and and uh, I think we, we, we have time, uh, but we start with the simple problem first and not try to complicate uh, the, the, the larger issues that we need to address in the future that will impede our current discussions is how do we then, how do we even start commercializing, bring the services into the, the city? And, and we need to start, uh, start this um, very, very simple. Uh, and I, I think just now, I want to go back to one of the questions that Sasha asked earlier, is it why, I mean, why, why are we doing so many demonstrations around the world? And I think one, one part that, uh, that we want to really address is, is the part on like uh, public acceptance, because we, we need to let people know that it's really coming, uh, and it's not as scary at, as it seems. Uh, we want to show people that this, this is not as... Uh, you, you don't bring that kind of noise pollution that people will think. You don't bring that kind of um, disruptions to, to traffic or to the economy or to your current mode of transport. And, and, and that's what we want to bring uh, in, in, into the, uh, the, the market. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, Jelly, I'm grateful that you, uh, that you mentioned this because... Um, one thing was on the question, how many, how many times do we have to repeat these demos, was to train the stakeholders, the, the, the actors, huh? the, the NAAs, the, uh, those who are part of this uh, chain. But the citizens yeah. are, are maybe the biggest, one of the biggest stakeholders in this, this. So you may also want to train the citizens what it means to bring EV tolls into their cities. Uh, and this may be a motivation in its own to repeat uh, frequently, uh, even at the same places, potentially um, those those demo operations. No, yeah. please. Yeah. So I mean, social acceptability is definitely an important part for us. It's it's a uh, very sort of like a, uh, a basis that we need to work on. I mean, I touched upon that yesterday on my other panel, where I think it was really a, an important statement that um, we, as the as an industry, are really looking at technology. That's what we're more interested in. I mean, we all love aviation and we love looking at the technology and the aircraft and everything. And sort of like social acceptability is something that is the back of our head and then we, we know that we need to think about it, but it sort of like comes second. And I think that is really a mistake. I think we all need to be very well aware of uh, the concerns for social acceptability uh, and use this demonstration, use these sandboxes uh, to really sort of like inform uh, a massive, I mean, the, the biggest audience as possible. So for example, in our case and with, um, with Volocopter, we have done in March 2022, so a year now, a noise measurement campaign. Uh, so it was literally having uh, the, the, the French Civil Aviation Authority's microphone, but it was also an association, independent association microphones in the ground uh, and public transport microphone in the ground. So we had like a lot of microphones just there. Uh, and uh, the VC2X from uh, Volocopter flying above uh, this microphone, different altitudes, different speeds. Um, and, and we use actually the audience there to, to actually ask questions through a questionnaire. And the answers were really sort of positive. I mean, we had like 86% of people happily surprised about the noise. Uh, we even, for the story, we have an, like her, our CEO uh, doing an interview with the media uh, and the, 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 the VC2X was literally at the back, 30 meters away, and he could do the entire interview. Not like a helicopter, sort of like, and you can't hear anything. He could do the entire interview without any problem about the noise. And, you know, that sort of thing is really engaging the audience and, and, uh, and gaining in social acceptability. And IASA has done actually a, a study in social acceptability back in 2019. And the results are really promising. Uh, it was like 83% of people interviewed were feeling positive about the introduction of UM. 71% of people interviewed were ready to use it, which I think is really interesting also to, to have that in mind. And we have done it again with Volocopter in Paris, in the Paris region. We've done something similar, trying to gain uh, understanding of, uh, of the public and the social acceptability. And we have similar results. 74% of people uh, are actually feeling positive about UAM. And what is, in, what is really interesting is that they're feeling positive not because of the fact that it's environmental friendly, but because it's innovative. And that's what's really important. So 
The second step in these sort of questionnaires and sort of studies is to understand what are the concerns. EASA has done it really well, and then we've done it also in that study. And as you may know, so the first two is safety and security, so that's something that we really need to sort of communicate altogether better on that, uh, on that level. Uh, environmental concerns, obviously. And then comes like privacy and noise. Uh, and that's why like on these two levels, we definitely need to, as a group, and while we're doing all these demonstrations and the sandbox, use that to have an audience, public, and inform them. Because I think through information, and as we've done it for the noise measurement campaign, through information and through seeing and sort of living it, you understand it much better and you accept it also better in terms of social acceptability. There's another case, and then we talked about that earlier today with the, uh, with the region of California and North Holland. Uh, we all understand that medical use cases is really important. So even for us, Paris Airport, uh, we were more about like airport connections to start with, but now we're working with uh, Paris hospitals uh, to work on like medical use cases because we know in terms of like it's important for the people to know that you can use it for other medical use cases and then we're working really closely to use eVTOL for these cases as well. Excellent. Anything you would like to <laughs> chime in here from, uh, from the... OEM perspective. So well, obviously, seeing is believing is a, is a is a strong point, right? Redo it, and then I, you stole my my phrase. Seeing is oh. believing, I, because <laughs> es essentially the, the most re recent demo campaigns we've done in Paris and Rome, it's it's really been fascinating being there because you have audiences who've never seen an EV toll flight before, and uh, we had this great experience in Paris. We drove a select crowd out on the top of an open double decker bus, and before the flight started, they were chatting. Half of them didn't turn around when the aircraft took off because <laughs> they didn't notice. And it, it's like in, in Rome, we had uh, hundreds of people out for the um, for, for the uh, Vertiport uh, opening and event. A and again, all of these people essentially become ambassadors, not necessarily for Volocopter or, or uh, Aeroporto Paris or Aeroporto di Roma, but for this technology oh and okay. for EV cells in general. So it really is seeing as believing. So. Training of stakeholders, familiarization, yeah. creating uh, creating ambassadors is yeah. another another notion. Interesting. Okay, um, we've got less than ten minutes to go, and we've we've a uh, few questions here which I don't want to miss to address at least some of them. Uh, the first one is uh, I'm not sure from an EASA perspective I am <laughs> in a position to answer, but let me. Le uh, no, it's okay. It's on the screen. Don't, um, I don't read that question even as, a, as an EASA representative. Everyone can read it, him, him or herself. Um, do my panelists wish to comment on, uh, or provide an answer to this question? It's a bit on the provocative side. I'll, I'll take a stab, but it's also saying, um, I'm, I'm sure that there are eVTOL manufacturers flying in Asia, Middle East, US, and other countries. But that's not because it's easier to fly there. That's because the manufacturers are there. I, I mean, I, I have, to my mind, I can't mention one European eVTOL manufacturer who's deliberately gone to another country or another continent to test. Uh, sure, there might be some limitations in where you are locally, but, but no one is moving their testing or their production to another continent because of that. And, and then there are some other structures that dis decide where are EV cell manufacturers. That's about funding, it's about the, the right circumstances and talent and all that kind of stuff. But it's not because of sandboxing opportunities. Okay. That's a, that's a, I think that's a clear enough uh, response uh, to that end. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, on the second one, do we need to change the hard law? Um, here's the 947 regulation to make sandboxes a reality. Do you think we need? <coughs> I'm yes. putting that question to you. Yes, if I may. Please. Um, uh, the, this, this situation is something that EASA is fully aware of, of it. That is something that we are working on, on it in the TEP, as you know, Sasha. And it's something that uh, we are, we, mm, are uh, working very close to Natale because we, we have two ideas. One is, of course, I, is, uh, we have to change the regulation, not the MC, the regulation, because uh, how it is writing now is only is operator-centric. But we have to, to, to think about sandboxes. So one idea is just to uh, grant it or issue 
a kind of approval LUC or whatever for the test center and then leave them to do their work, mm -hmm. their test. And the other idea maybe is doing something similar that, uh, that is uh, applying in the, in the, in the managed aviation. Maybe applying the Article 71 of basic regulation, we can go through a scheme of special condition and permit to fly. Because I, as I mentioned, the specific category, for instance, don't, doesn't allow f uh, people on board. But maybe if we can, let's say, uh, using this special condition and, and the permit to fly, we can go uh, and we can address all of these things that specific category is not, is not uh, I think, is not suitable. So in my opinion, yes, we have to, to change the hard law. But in parallel, we can do other things. We can modify the MCs or the guidance material to be more flexible with sales free operations. There, there are many things to do. So, but to, to sum up, yes, <laughs> I think we have to modify the, the, the regulation. Okay, other views? Camilla, you're nodding, so. I, uh, I, agree, I agree with, I yes? agree with, uh, with Joseph. Uh, <coughs> we need, uh, we, uh, flexible measures are not, uh, are not sufficient in, in this field because uh, as for the manufacturers, for the certified project, uh, pro, pro products as a certified, uh, we, we, we have a different, in part 21, we have different means uh, for the manufacturer to, to test uh, the innovative products uh, with permit to flight, not completely in compliance with the rule. So we have to create uh, a, a similar environment, a similar uh, situation for these new innovative art services because uh, uh, new product needs to be uh, tested. And uh, if not possible for new for uh, yeah. or manufacturer or, or uh, operator that are going to put into 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 service some new product, uh, direct uh, show compliance with SORA or with uh, with uh, with the actual regulation. So we need to to include the approach regulatory up, uh, sandbox approach in the hard uh, regulation. We establish uh, in Italy uh, we public uh, guidelines material, but it's just uh, a guidance material, not a rule. We we need the regulation, but it's not possible at a national level to establish a national uh, rule that uh, over regulate uh, and that uh, overlap with uh, with uh, European rule. So we needed to work together with uh, EASA. Thank you. Point is well taken, and uh, the good news is that uh, we are, as you as you are aware, we are in the process of collecting topics. Um, uh, after now two years of in-service experience, if I may say, with Regulation 947, what's working well, what ha what is not yet working uh, good enough as we expected. Uh, so we are opening up the book again now after two years, um, looking for improvements, and this could well be uh, one strong point which which should be considered in this inventory list of improvement proposals. Thank you. Um, and that uh, ties in quite nicely into the next question as to how a regulator is taking <laughs> the results of regulatory or, or sandboxes as such into account in during the rulemaking process. That's the way mm -hmm. I would read that question. Well, I think exactly that is uh, is, is a very principle of uh, is a very idea of that is a further r by reiterating, by fine tuning, by by uh, amending and improving the regulations. It's a it's a continuous process. We've always said uh, from from the perspective of EASA and and uh, notably so for the use space regulation, which is not our, our subject here. But we always said this is the very first shot. It's the very first. Not me as, as Sasha shot, but the very first shot of EASA as a regulator or the commission to enable um, the deployment. So the first, it's a starting point, okay? And then we see, and, and we, but we expect that we very frequently have to open the book again and make improvements, including to the AMC and GM, by the way. So not only the hard law. So um, this is anticipated. And on the last question, uh, briefly, um, the a typical eVTOL mission for some OEMs would be 140 kilometers uh, at four to 5,000 feet. But why is using uh, VFR routes integrating ATM not possible? 
Um, okay, this is this is one use case, one one of very many. Uh, I should maybe at this point remind that um, the the scope of operational envelopes when we speak about eVTOL, when we speak about IAM per se, is is super vast. This is this can be considered one. And if that was to be considered one, maybe that works under the given conditions. No, yep. so maybe maybe there is no need to think to rethink anything. Um, but but we are, we are not we are not only at least talking about such a uh, such a conops, correct? Yes. So uh, wow, timer is at zero, and um, uh, that's that's uh, that's good news because I'm also very hungry. But I would <laughs> like to. <laughs> I'd like to uh, sum up, and um, we have, well, obviously we have we have scratched our heads the, uh, before before we came up here um, as to what is maybe one or two of the key takeaway messages that we would like to give you at hand uh, before leaving this uh, this room at the end of our session, uh, to which we all could subscribe, okay, in a way. Although there was a good chunk of controversy, which is good and normal. Uh, but at least we have identified few bold things that I'd like to share with you very briefly. Statement number one. Experimental sandboxes are considered important and beneficial to test interactions between all actors of a or any new ecosystem. Statement number two. It appears often in discussions that we currently have that type certification seems to be the holy grail of the magic. That's what we need. And that's the only thing that we need. And then we can fly happily and peacefully and safely. Um, but um, while in order to make a type certified aircraft fly commercially, many other components such as operational rules pilot licensing, maintenance requirements, infrastructure, etc. cetera, just to mention a few, uh, are equally important like a type certificate. And everything has to come together at the same point in time in order to enable a commercial operation. Often in our discussions and in media, when do you get the type certificate? As if this was the only thing that's needed. So statement number two is just to alert and raise awareness. Type certification obviously is very important is not the only uh, important thing that needs to be considered, like when identifying the various stakeholders that we have discussed here. And then statement number three, it appears to our collective experience, as we had discussed here, that repetitive demonstrations seem to be the right way to identify, test, and validate um, IAM deployment in various and different EU regions or cities um, and uh, that uh, that it might even uh, serve as to d discover and identify stakeholders that we may not have been uh, anticipated in conventional aviation before. So those th reflect on those three statements. That's what we wanted to give you at hand as a takeaway. I thank you very much for having stayed with us this late uh, during the day. Apologies again for the delayed departure of this session. Um, again, as mentioned before, I hope there was something in it for every one of you in that in, in that one hour and a bit, and I'm very thankful for my panelists to having found the time uh, and the energy to join me here. Thank you very much. Thank you.